Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 115 of the podcast. And today I'm chatting all about UFOs, our unfinished objects or unfinished projects that might have been in a drawer or bin for years. And I really want to walk through 10 steps to taking a project that's been stuck like that for a long period of time and working through it and getting it to the finish line, getting it done so you can use it, so you can enjoy it. So that's what this episode is going to be all about. And you can jump ahead to the actual topic of the podcast. Just check below the video so that you can see where a timestamp of where that topic begins. Because I always like to start the podcast with a little introduction and share what I'm doing around the house and an update on what I got done. And since I've now moved to an every other week podcast, I have quite a few things to catch you guys up on. So yeah, if you want to jump ahead and get straight to UFOs, definitely do so. And if not, hang out with me as I work on a new quilt. Um, because my big update this week is I have gotten lots of things done. I have been really knocking out my UFOs in the past two weeks, and that feels amazing. Uh, so this podcast is actually really topical because right behind me, I have a quilt that was in a drawer for six years, I think six years and now it is almost almost completed quilt top uh, and then it's going to go on the long arm and I'm this is going to be the first goddess throw quilt that I am quilting. I'm super, super excited about it. So a quick intro, uh, little uh, description for the audio. Um, basically, this is an Express Your Love goddess. It's a uh, particular goddess that I did tiny, tiny hexagons for her face and her arm and her body. So it took a long time to get all that done. Uh, I ended up doing just regular traditional freezer paper applique for the rest of her. I did not do that by hand. I just decided I'm going to stitch it out by machine. And then once I finished the center of the goddess, kind of the, the center of the quilt, I already have three or four of these. This was a quilt for a quilt along that I shared in 2013. So I already have several of the wall hanging version of her. I don't really need another wall hanging of the same quilt. So I decided that this would be my first goddess throw quilt. So I needed to expand it. So I designed a very simple landscape border and then I found, I ran across some Hawaiian free, well, it was kind of faux Hawaiian quilt blocks in a bin that I've been saving these for years and years and years. And I pulled those out and trimmed them down to 15 inches. And then I have these landscapes that I created for the sides and the top and the bottom. So now it is a fairly good sized throw quilt that I'm going to enjoy curling up with on the couch. And my plan is to put Minky on the back. So I am super excited about that. I'm really excited about quilting it on the long arm because it will be easier to quilt big and to keep the quilting motifs very simple. It will be easy to, um, to create texture, but not clobber it with too much quilting, which has been kind of a problem I've run into with my goddess quilts for a while. Um, because they're, you know, they're very special quilts to me, I tend to hmm, clobber them with quilting. So I'm really hoping that putting it on the long arm, and I'm planning on doing this on my continuum frame with my Grace Kunik 21 long arm, um, so I'm going to have a maximum amount of quilting space. I'll be able to knock out that entire border in one pass. So that's going to be super exciting. And I'll be able to create lots of different videos to share with you guys along the way. So that will be coming up soon. Um, I just shared this past week, actually, speaking of my frame, uh, I just shared this past week my long arm room remodel. Uh, just a quick video on how that room changed and the massive difference that just painting the walls made. Um, so this was kind of a multi-step renovation that I've done here and actually dad <laughs> did most of the work because <laughs> I was working on the goddess quote book. So dad, yeah, got in there and he painted all of the walls. He patched them up for me because they were really, they were really in bad shape. I am one of those types of people that if I need a hook or if I need a camera mount or I need, you know, whatever I need, I'm going to go drill into the ceiling, drill into the wall. I put big giant gaping <laughs> holes in the wall. And I mean, it's just like, well, I need it right there. So I'm just going to go do it. And I just don't have, to, I just can't be precious about it and worry about that. And then of course I end up with really ugly, horrible looking walls. So dad patched all that stuff up and made it look great. And then we moved the embroidery machine over to the other corner and that is working out great. 
And then the next step is the expansion of the long arm. So the frame, I mean, the long arm can't expand, but the frame can. So now I can quilt much bigger quilts. So there will be another video coming up this Friday on how I expanded the frame and kind of the process of how that worked. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm I, just this week, I placed my order for automation. This is uh, computerized quilting. And I'm really excited about that. I don't know when I'll start shooting videos on that because from my experience with expanding the frame, I've decided I'm probably gonna put the automation on the frame and build it and then I'll take it all off and then I'll shoot a video step by step on how to install it. Because I, the first time I put something together, I'm really learning and it's only after doing it once that I kind of figure everything out and then take it all apart and then do it again <laughs> for another video. I know it's kind of crazy, but I feel like that's an important step just to show each step of the process, especially automation is really an up, a huge upgrade for the machine, for the frame. Um, it is making a computer uh, run the machine so that I, I won't have to touch the machine anymore. The, the machine will move itself basically, which is really kind of cool. So it's using technology. I'm super excited about that. I've got a tablet coming to run that and the automation. And that's actually on special. Um, it was on special all through uh, August. And then we've extended that promotion through uh, September too. So if you are interested in having a computer move your long arm for you and do the quilt and you can select designs and put things in places. It's just so neat. Uh, yeah, you can come and check it out at leahday.com slash QCT. That's Quilters Creative Touch. I think that's the acronym. Sorry. I always get the acronym switched up. So it's like, I always think it's QTC, like Quilters Touch Creative, which doesn't make any sense. So I'm always flipping that in my head. Uh, so I have to be really careful whenever I say it, but I will probably set up hyperlinks for both of those. So whether it is leahday.com slash QTC or leahday.com slash QCT, you'll get there either way. <laughs> now, if I seem just a little bit on the loopy side, guys, there's a reason for it. <laughs> James was in school, of course, very first week, and he brought home a cold and Josh caught it and was, I mean, really, honestly, this isn't a cold, this is a flu. And so Josh caught it and was really down and out. Uh, Josh, you know, doesn't normally catch colds badly, you know, or get the sick. Uh, and he was just down for the count for three days. And then right now, I'm feeling it come on, you know, that kind of calm before the storm. I'm feeling a little on the loopy side. I am, of course, chugging down Airborne, which is uh, one of my favorite kind of cold remedies, but I can, I can feel it, you know, how it's like my brain's not quite clicking and uh, I'm really hot, so I can feel the fever coming on too. So I know what I'm in for for the next three days, which is why I decided, okay, I need to go on ahead and get this introduction done so that way I can go to bed <laughs> most likely and you know knowing how bad it hit Josh most likely I'm going to be in bed for the next couple of days and that's just you know it's just part of having kids right I mean you can't really avoid it um they just bring home colds and of course James didn't catch it I think Josh might have caught it when he went like he went into the um the office the main office of the school to grab something real quick and I think he might have caught it there you know it's just germy places right schools are just germy so yeah that's going to be a factor this week but that's not a big deal because as I said I have been getting so much stuff done that I almost feel like it'll be a good time to kind of have a break a little bit of a break and a little bit of a pause because my goddess book is now ready for uploading and I am so delighted by how this has come out. Of course, more red ink or Josh's blue ink, um, but you can kind of see an idea of the photos and the layout. I'm flipping through it here, um, but you can also see a couple images that I've shared to uh, freemotionproject.com with the show notes. I am really, really excited about this. Uh, and uh, the photos are all done. I exported all of those last night. All I have to do is pop them into the layout, the official photos that kind of, um, I kind of did placeholders twice and then now I have the correct sizes and everything looks great and it's all sharpened for printing and it's almost done. And um, this next stage of the game is tedious and time consuming and hard 
because it's basically um, I have to upload and then print a cop, you know, get a copy printed and sent to me. And that always seems to take forever and ever and ever. Uh, even whenever I set it up to have it ship super quick, it always takes about seven to 10 days. And you know, while I'm waiting, I can't really do anything. I can't really make changes on the book or anything like that because uh, obviously I don't want to change anything that would then throw off that sample. So, you know, it's just kind of upload, be patient, get the sample in, and then see if anything needs to change. And by this point, I, I have already learned there is no hope for a first time, you know, get it done and, and have it be successful it always is gonna need multiple uploads, more than once, usually two, sometimes three times, to catch all the little errors. Uh, you know, Josh went through the book again and, and did another line edit, uh, and then I figured out how to turn on spell check on my program, which had been off previously, and I went through and I was like, oh, there is a misspelled word on every single page. I am not the world's best speller, guys. I really am not. Um, but that's what spell check is for. So uh, I kind of pointed that out to Josh. It's like, you know, I think between the two of us, you would think we would have caught the, this, but it's, it is, it's really easy to miss like, you know, um, little words, missing little words, double little words, you know, when, you know, like um, you might, I might be editing a sentence and then rewrite it and then end up with, you know, two, two or the, the, um, it's just your brain kind of skips over the extra word or skips over the missing word. And so it's really hard to catch that thing without a computer program helping you out and noticing that kind of thing for you. So that was really good. Uh, I feel great about this. I mean, it's, there's a side of me that's a little bit on the terrified side because this book is really personal. There's, um, there's a, a personal journey and um, there's a lot of things in this book that I have not ever shared and talked about before. And, um, that's a little terrifying because it, you know, it is very vulnerable in a lot of ways, but there is another side of that. And that is that I have been wanting to share this for years. I've been wanting to put this out there for years. And so on that side, it, you know, I kind of feel like, well, this is terrifying and scary, but it's also exactly what I have been wanting to do for a very long time. So in that respect, it feels like I am, I am living up to my highest potential. I am doing what uh, my heart most wanted to create for a very long time. And that is amazing. That's where it's at, guys. It really is. And I talk about that a lot today in the podcast as far as, you know, working on projects that are most meaningful. And I've been thinking about this a lot because, of course, I always have just this pile, pile, pile of projects where, you know, um, books and, and workshops and classes and just so many things that are kind of always beating <laughs> the door down in my head, you know, like, do me next, do me next, you know, you have to make me next. Um, and I've been feeling this, you know, in kind of intense pressure to go, you know, get on the good stuff, you know, go, go, you know, fix all those other books and get all those other books started and stuff like that. And I've been feeling a lot of pressure. And uh, I was listening to an interview last night, actually, with Jordan Peterson, is a motivational person, um, scholar, and I absolutely love his book. Um, I think it's 12 Lessons for Life, 12 Rules for Life, something like that. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And I highly recommend the audiobook version of it. Um, but he said something in, in this interview that I was listening to, and he said, um, you will... Uh, there is always something else and you will never get ahead of it. <laughs> and I, it was kind of, you know, a different context, but, you know, he was talking about life in general, but that I found that very comforting because, you know, it's completely right. You know, I've just, I'm nearly done with this goddess quote book, but already there's, you know, three other projects in my head. They're like, you know, next, next, next. Uh, and, you know, there's a frustration that comes with that, you know, feeling like I'll never, there'll never be a point where I'm ahead of the game. And hearing that from Jordan, it's like, well, no, I never will be. Never will be. There will always be something else. There will always be another book. There will always be pressure to, um, to start that next thing. And I have to stay focused on what I'm doing right now. 
And so September is going to be upload month. <laughs> and what's really funny is this is exactly what happened last year. Last year, I would spent September uploading Mally the Maker. And uh, in between uploads, I would work on the Miss Bunny sewing pattern, the doll pattern. Uh, so it was a, it was a very patient, um, slow, steady month of, you know, upload, get the book, get a copy, you know, check it out, make some changes, upload again, that whole nine yards. I think this month is going to be, you know, an upload month again. And then uh, I'm also going to do, record the audiobook version of the Goddess Quilt Book. Now, it's not a ton of text. It won't be a very long audiobook, but you know, for audiophiles like me, I mean, and I assume if you're listening to a podcast that you like audio too, um, I think that it's definitely something that I want to read. I want to put myself, you know, in it. Um, there are parts of the book I can't read without crying, so I'm gonna have to work on that <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and there's an, an emotion that you can put into an audiobook that you can't put in written word. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I think that'll fit time-wise and schedule-wise, you know, to kind of upload the book and then um, record the audio. I, I don't think it'll take more than two or three days to record that and then get it edited and ready to go. And then I think with the audiobook version, I'll, I'm will i not sure exactly what I can upload to go along with that, but I'm going to see if I can upload a PDF version of the book because it's so visual um, to have the audiobook and then you also get the ebook version of the book too. And I think I think that'll work out really well. I don't think it would work if it was just the audiobook because it's, you know, it's a book of beautiful goddess quilt pictures, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. And that's really exciting because audio, I, I've been really thinking and, and working through, you know, what, what, what do I really want to be doing? What do I really want to get into? And audio is my thing, guys. It really is. Although I love video and obviously, you know, I, I shoot tons of videos every single week and I love that side of things too. I am constantly listening to something, you know, whether it's audiobooks or, um, I'll turn on YouTube and, and listen to, you know, lectures with Jordan Peterson, you know, different things like that. And I, I love listening to pod, other podcasts and, and, and different things. Um, you know, Joanna Penn, the Creative Penn podcast, listen to that uh, quite frequently and, uh, you know, just different ones like that. So I, I'm really thinking about diving more and, and becoming more committed to audio. And that also means narrating Mally the Maker. I've been wanting to do that. I, my plan had been to narrate that in January this year and then just kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back for various reasons. And so my plan is definitely get started on Mally after I narrate the Goddess Quilt book. And then I'll have all that experience narrating. So I think that the audio will be even clearer, even, you know, even just, just being able to perfect that technique. And I'm recording that in my <laughs> recording studio, basically my bedroom closet. <laughs> and it works, it has great audio. And if, you, um, if you'd like to just hear kind of a little snippet of what that sounds like, um, check out the story I recorded a couple weeks ago. I think that was in, that had to have been in June. Um, Scant and the Quarter Scamming Baby Chicks. That was a story that Josh and a little bit of James wrote. Uh, they kind of tag teamed on that book, on that little story. and. Um, I read it and had a great time reading it. And then James and I are working on a new story that has actually, his short story and kind of the questions that he started asking and stuff really got me thinking about Mally book two. And uh, just in case you have not read Mally uh, book one, you can come and check it out at mallythemaker.com. And I had such a fun time writing that book last year, guys. It was, it really was the highlight of last year. And I, and I love the whole series. I really want to get into this. But some of what James was saying and, and the questions he was asking really started to get my kind of creative juices going. And it kind of influenced what I'm going to be putting into book two. Uh, so I already had some plans and, and I already had, you know, a good bit of text written, but it's interesting how um, James's take on it as a 12 year old kind of started to influence that. And of course, the influence of a little boy versus, you know, I was really thinking when I wrote Mally of, you know, me being 10 or 12 uh, and, and kind of 
I was pulling in that inspiration, but now I'm kind of coming from a different place. And I think that's exactly right. I think that's perfect because uh, each book will, you know, is going to stand alone, but also continue on this amazing journey. So yeah, super, super excited about all of that. Lots of, lots of fun things coming soon. Uh, so another big finish that I had this month, and that was my Goddess Cross Stitch. And this was a project in progress since I was uh, 14 or 15 years old. And I finally got all of the stitching done. I needed, an, I needed a photo of that quilt for the Goddess Quilt Book too. So I got it all finished and here's a picture of it. Super happy with that. And of course, then I go to pop it into the frame that I had already bought and it doesn't fit. <laughs> so frustrating. So I'm gonna have to go buy another frame and I have a, another little uh, Express Your, uh, my beaded version of the Express Your Love quilt actually too. And both of those need to be framed. So I'm gonna go on ahead and get both frames, finish up all of those projects and those will be, it just, it feels so good to be closing the door on all of those projects. And then that's opening up more room for new projects that are exactly what I want to be working on right now. And one thing I've been missing since I finished up, I finished up uh, the Express Your Love, that was a handwork project, and then I finished up the cross stitch, that was also a handwork project. So I haven't had another handwork project to work on, which I've been missing. And so that's when I decided it was time to get started on my double wedding ring. And it's actually not for me, it's for my mother-in-law. Uh, and so I took all of my, um, it's Josh's grandmother's clothes that uh, I was given in January and I took them and cut them up. So this is like a sleeve that I carefully cut all the seams off uh, and got everything flat. Now I've starched this, I washed it all, cut it up. Now I've starched it. And then also I just applied a layer of French Fuse. This is a lightweight fusible interfacing that will help to stabilize it and thicken because this isn't 100% cotton fabric and it was also worn as clothing. So that, um, you know, you can get like little micro holes and stuff in fabric and clothing that you don't see, but it will wear, especially in a quilt. It will start, that will be an area that starts to pull and wear. And so that's why I stabilized it with French Fuse, very, very lightweight tricot knit uh, interfacing. You can see it's still very floppy. It's still very much fabricy. And then now I am cutting out my pieces or at least getting my pieces prepped up and figuring out what color is gonna go to what. I think um, just getting everything cut into strips so that then I can plan and figure out, okay, well, I'm gonna go with, you know, this particular fabric for maybe the cornerstones. Uh, it is, I'm using the Paper Pieces Double Wedding Ring Pack of uh, English Paper Piecing. And the reason I chose to do this is because I don't want to precisely cut out these pieces and have to piece them together exactly on my sewing machine. I've, I've used every known double wedding ring template there's out there and I've never found them to really be exactly as persnickety perfect as I like them to be. Uh, paper pieces is English paper piecing. Uh, wrap the fabrics individually around the, this kind of hard cardstock type fabric, these shapes, uh, base them in place and then they'll be kind of whip stitched together. This will be exact. This will be, because it'll be by hand, it will be absolutely exact. Everything will match up perfectly and it'll be a handwork project that I can work on for the next several months, I would bet. Uh, and it'll be something fun to do in the evening. So yeah, I'm getting all this prepped up today and I have all of my fabrics here soaking in starch. I got that as a really good question this week. Um, how long do I let something soak in starch if I'm, if I'm doing the soak method? Typically, I'm not that patient. This is more of dad's technique. You know, if I've handed him 10 yards of fabric to starch and press, he's learned by now that, you know, kind of using a squeeze bottle and doing that number all day is, hurts his hands. So he, he doesn't like to do that anymore and I don't blame him. So instead, he takes those 10 yards of fabric, puts it in a plastic bin, then takes the entire bottle of starch and just pours it over the plastic bin. And then depending on how much fabric it is, if it doesn't seem to be enough, then he'll grab another bottle. I, I, I buy out the grocery store. Whenever I go to the grocery store, I just buy out all of the bottles of starch that I like and, uh, and then um, let it soak. And the, the question that I received this week, which was really good, and that was how long do you let it soak? 
And the answer is, as long as it takes for it to go through all of the layers, you don't want to leave it soaking so long that the fabrics start to mold. Uh, and you also don't want them to dry out. So like if I don't get done with this today and process through all of this, then I'll just put a lid on it. I might put it in the fridge and that's A-OK. -okay. But you just don't want to, like I wouldn't want to get all of this wet and then leave it for like two weeks out in humid North Carolina weather and it would probably start to mold. <laughs> and then I'd have to wash it and go start all over again, which wouldn't be a lot of fun. So yeah, kind of committed now. I've got to get it all done. Um, but that's, that's generally the starching method that we choose now, mostly because when we're processing fabric, it's not a half yard or a yard. It's usually five to 10 yards of fabric at a time. That's just a reality of, you know, when, I, when I'm ready to start something, we're gonna start it with a bang, right? So yeah, I am I'm feeling, like I said, loopy, but I'm also feeling very relieved that I got um, both of these goddess quilts, you know, well, the, the goddess cross stitch and this goddess quilt behind me, the throat quilt, um, to the point that they got to. And I think I know, actually, I would not have gotten them to that stage if I hadn't had the goddess quilt book and wanted photographs of those quilts to go in the book and uh, learned even more about photography. And you know, this time around uh, doing the photographs for this book, learned even more about editing uh, and, and you know, creating the right files and all that good stuff. Um, had to pull in some older photos that were taken not with a good camera, you know, in a long time ago. Uh, and I was worried about that because there are some quilts that, you know, don't exist anymore like sinkhole that I only had those photos. I didn't have anything else. And, you know, so I had a limited number of photos. Uh, only one or two of them would have worked in any particular space. And I had to figure out how to edit those and make them work in a book and, and still look good. And so that was a, that was a bit of a challenge, but that was good. And I feel really, really pleased with how the photos came out. And it's making me really want to double down also on photography. You know, I feel like these, all these mini skills. <laughs> there's, there's so much to play with, there's so much to do, but I really enjoy photography and I really enjoy book narration. So I'm wanting to lean into these things that I love doing so much. And, you know, I talked about this two weeks ago in the, in the last podcast episodes, like the only thing that really starts to feel frustrating is when I have to feel like I have to do any of this stuff on a tight, tight deadline. Like I, you know, got to get it done, got to get it done, that kind of thing. That's the only time that it feels frustrating to be the person that's doing all of the things, you know, uh, and I'm working on that. Just spending more time planning, budgeting time, knowing how, you know, estimating how long something is going to take, estimating and seeing, um, you know, how, how much I need to open up my schedule to allow something all the time that it's going to need in order to be created. And I think that's a large part why we end up with so many unfinished projects is maybe just a, a lack of understanding of how much time it's going to take to get something done. And I talk about this a lot in the How Do I Quilt This series. Um, now this is a a special series of videos that I share for the Quilt Friends Club and I share one video a month uh, and it's basically you post your photos if you're a member of the group you post a photo of a quilt that you're needing help uh, knowing how to quilt it and then I share three different quilting design ideas and along the way what I'm also explaining is why something is going to take more time uh, and let me know if you would like a podcast specifically devoted to this, you know, so you, when you're going into a quilt, I, I had this idea, but I'd like to know what you guys think about it. Um, so that when you're going into a quilt project, you could know and be able to estimate how much time it's going to take. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, buy this complex Baltimore album quilt kit. <laughs> that is, you know, Baltimore albums are pretty intense, guys, just saying. Uh, and, you know, if your expectation is to get that done in a month, honey, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Applique is time consuming, it's slow. You know, I can, I can bet you I will still be working on this double wedding ring quilt in January. Um, that would be my estimation, although, you know, I, I don't really know, but that would be my estimation is that I might be getting this thing done in January. 
because of, of the time-consuming nature of handwork and the time-consuming nature of English paper piecing and applique. So it's, it's knowing and going into a project with a solid understanding of the commitment of time that is going to be behind it. So let me know if that would be a podcast topic that you are interested in. And yes, please join in the fun of our friendship club. You can come and check it out at quiltfriends.club. And as a member, you are also entered to win our giveaway each month. And I had a little bit of a trouble getting in touch with one of our giveaway people a couple weeks ago. So we're going to do this one again. Uh, so this giveaway is uh, Bally Pops uh, two and a half inch strips in beautiful colors of black and gray. And this one is going to go to Fran Harper. So congratulations, Fran. And then this one is our uh, fat quarter bundle of... Uh, Carolyn Freelander Fabrics is a beautiful fat quarter bundle and this is going to go to Ann Nielsen. So thank you guys so much for being members of the Quilt Friends Club and a special thank you to our new members Fran Harper, Marty Frangle, Mary Temis, Nancy Hennings, and Sheila Bennett. Thank you guys so much and you can join in the fun too at quiltfriends.club. So that's pretty much it for the intro today. Thank you guys so much for listening. And I hope that you enjoy this podcast all about finishing your UFOs and most specifically finishing the unfinished projects that will mean the most to you. So enjoy. And until next time, let's go quilt. Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day and welcome to episode 115 of the podcast. And today I'm going to share 10 tips for finishing your unfinished projects. And this is going to kind of be a really kind of a step-by-step -step process more than anything else. Uh, my method, how I have been working through my unfinished projects, and I have quite a lot. And uh, the way that I work through it, it's kind of uh, methodical and it seems to be working really well as far as getting things done that I really want to use and enjoy in my home and then passing on or just simply deciding not to work on projects that don't mean as much to me. Uh, and this was inspired by my friend Anne. Hello, Anne. And she has sent me this question. She said, what is the difference between a UFO, an unfinished object? This is one of the acronyms that quilters like to use. Uh, what is the difference between a UFO and a WIP? WIP stands for work in progress. And I thought this was a great question because uh, it really kind of separates and categorizes our projects in a way. A WIP is something that you are actively working on. So it is something that is on your sewing machine right now or on your couch and you're doing handwork or you're taking it on trips and traveling with it. Um, it is a work in progress, meaning you are actively doing work on it and it is getting your time and attention. A UFO, in my opinion, is a project that is stuck, that is not actively getting your attention, that has not been stitched on for six months to a year, that is not going anywhere and it is going to stay <laughs> in its unfinished state for the indefinite future because it's not being worked on. And this is the thing, um, I'm gonna come back to this several times and that is the simple fact of the matter is anything is going to remain uh, unfinished and stuck forever if it does not get worked on. And everything and anything could be finished if you only worked on it a little bit every day uh, or a little bit every week. So I want you to think about that as far as you know, you might have a big backlog of quilt tops that need to be quilted, things that need to happen with them. But if you put just, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes into those projects every single day or every single week, you are going to see progress and progress keeps you moving forward. And eventually, it may not be tomorrow, but eventually that pro project is going to get done. Okay, so tip number one or step number one is to pull out all of your UFOs, get them out of the bins, get them out of the drawers, get them out of the closet and make a list of all of them. Now this is overwhelming. I have over 50 UFOs and that can be everything from unfinished quilt tops to projects where I've half cut it out and then stuck it in a bin. Uh, for me, I have whole books, <laughs> which is a whole different scale of UFO, you know, where it's multiple quilts that are all going to go together and be in something together. Uh, so, you know, I try and keep those things together, but 
it's really good to pull everything out in one go and make a list of all of it and say, okay, oh, there is that, you know, double Irish chain that I started back in 2002. And oh, there's that nine patch that I started back in, you know, 2012 and make a list. You don't have to necessarily remember when you started it, but just make a list of all of the projects. And this is most important. This is the most important step of that list. Try to figure out what is the next step on the project. If it's a finished quilt top, obviously it just needs to be basted and quilted. If it is uh, a in progress quilt top, then what needs to happen next? Do you need to piece more blocks? Do you need to put the blocks together with sashing? Do you need to add a border? Uh, what is it that caused it to be folded up and put away instead of moving to the next step. So that's step number one is pull out all the UFOs and make a list of all of them. On to step number two, and that is to go through all of your UFOs and it really does help to have them all pulled out all on a table or all on the floor where you can look at all of them. And I do mean all of them. Don't forget about the UFOs that you have stashed in the closet. Don't forget about the ones that are stashed under your lung arm or under your sewing machine or the ones that you've hidden under your bed or spread out somewhere else. Mine tend to you know, go all over the house a little bit. So pull them all together, all in one place. And it really does help if they're all on a tabletop so you can stand and do this. I find that I have better energy when I'm standing versus when I'm setting and I tend to hunch over. So try and put everything on a tabletop, like your dining room table and stand up and then go through them one at a time. And this is coming from the Marie Kondo method of organization. And that is to pick up each project, hold it in your hands and ask yourself, does it still bring you joy? But really, I think the number one thing is, is it still meaningful? Can you imagine finishing that quilt and cuddling up with it in front of a fire? Can you imagine it being on your bed? Do you crave having that quilt be wrapped around your grandbaby? You know, do you, do you just really, really wish that that was finished so you could have it on your wall? Is that a perfect quilt for a perfect spot in your home? And you know, is it like that? Or is it kind of meh? That meh is really important. You want to note that when you feel that I, I could care less, you know, I could care less about this project. It doesn't mean anything to me. It does not cherished. I do not crave it. I do not uh, look forward to the day that I'm wrapped up in it. I do not look forward to the day I can give it away and see it, you know, being played with by my grandkids or by my kids. It doesn't mean anything. And that meaning I think is the most important thing to pay attention to set all of those projects. I'm not saying to throw them away, but I'm saying set all of them aside into a separate pile because they don't just, they just simply aren't priority. The projects that you should be focusing on that should get your most attention are the ones that are the most meaningful, the most special, and the ones that will bring you the most joy. Now, they also might be the most scary projects to work on. And we're going to work through that as we go through this podcast about how to work through those fears that can come up, especially when we're working on something that's very important to us, that has a lot of meaning that we're just really excited about. Uh, and sometimes we can get stuck in that fear of messing it up or not having the skills to get that project finished. So make note of that. Go through everything, touch everything, pull it out of the bags. You know, PIGS is another acronym that quilters often use, and that is projects in grocery sacks. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, so pull it out of the grocery sack, you know, go on ahead and feel it, touch it, spread it out. Try and remember why it got put away in the first place. That's really important. And then also note that emotional reaction that you have to your projects. And if you feel that meh, I don't really care, you know, take it or leave it. Don't really like it anymore. Don't like those fabrics anymore. Those projects are going to go into one pile. The projects that really mean something to you are going to go into another pile. Okay, on to number three, and that is from those projects that are in the meaningful pile, separate them by the method that they need to be finished. So what's the next step? I think this is really important. You need to make add to that list that you've already created. What is the next step in the process? 
and what method is required in order to do that. So we have projects that need to be pieced, we have projects that need to be quilted, we have projects that need to be have handwork, you know, so hand stitching that, that is construction or that could be uh, hand embellishment quilting, I don't know. You need to make that list so that way you know what is the next step. And then these different things go in different places. So I do handwork on my couch upstairs and that's where I like to have the project set up with the thread, with the needles, with the scissors, everything that I need so I can, I don't have to think about it. I just plop down on the couch every evening after dinner and there's my handwork project and I don't even have to think, it's right there. And so it's natural to just grab my needle and thread and start working on it. If you make it work, you know, oh, I gotta go do that, I gotta go get that, I gotta go pull it all together, you know, and we're tired in the evening, you know, there's not a lot of energy to go around and you have this whole big, like for me, it's like, oh, if I have to go wind some bobbins, ugh, I'm not gonna bother with it. <laughs> I'm mean, quite honestly too lazy to wind bobbins sometimes and that will stop me from working on a project. But if you can go in ahead and get the project where you have the bobbins wound, where you have it in the spot where you like to do that thing, whether it's quilting on one machine or quilting on your long arm or uh, hand quilting on your couch, have it in that spot with the right tools, the right materials, you have it in the right space, then it's gonna be that much easier for you to work on it. So this kind of three is kind of a two-parter and that is to get, you know, know what the next step is and to get it in that right place with all of those materials. And this can be quite time consuming. You know, if you think about uh, a quilt top that you're ready to work on, well, it needs to be basted. So you need batting and backing fabric. Uh, and so that's requiring an expense. So, I mean, it might be that some of your, your quilt tops are not being quilted simply because there's a lot of money that goes into finishing a quilt top. Uh, and you need to start, you know, kind of, you know, budgeting for this, I should say. And it's really easy. And I know how easy it is because I make this mistake myself. It's really easy to go buy that new fabric and be like, oh, I want to make something new. And we're going to get into why that is very, very addictive and really, really easy. To, it's kind of a trap to get stuck into. Uh, but you've got to think about what is the next step on the projects that are most meaningful and going ahead and get it ready to go. So, you know, you have that pile of projects that are meaningful. Let's say you've got five quilt tops. Well, out of those five quilt tops, pick one that you're gonna go on ahead and get basted and ready for quilting. And, you know, if it's on, if, if it's your long arm, you're still going to need to cut your backing fabric, cut your batting, get everything prepped up. So it's a simple process of going in there, getting everything set up, getting everything ready to go. On a home sewing machine, Basting is kind of a chore and you know, you might need to plan that out, whether it's around a guild meeting and get some guild friends to help you baste, uh, or it's, you know, kind of pulling out folding tables. I used to pull out folding tables, multiple folding tables in order to baste on my dining room table. Uh, so, you know, it is a chore, but this is the next step required in the process. So go on ahead and figure out what that is and then start budgeting your time where it's like, well, I can't do that today, but I could maybe do that Saturday. And then you could have kind of a basting party <laughs> and have some friends over and, you know, get all of your quilts basted and ready to go, ready for that next step. Okay, number four, all UFOs. All unfinished projects are so much easier to ignore, are so much easier to pretend they don't exist and forget about them when they are tucked away in cabinets, when they are tucked away in closets, when they are tucked away in drawers. And I know I have had so many more UFOs pile up over the last few years because I was keeping everything tucked very much away and out of sight and out of mind. So it was just that much easier to just go piece another quilt top. You know, it's that much easier to go impulse buy fabric because I'm not seeing all that I have left to finish that really, you know, I would really like to have finished, I would really like to have displayed in my home, I really like to be using on my bed or on my couch or be able to give it away. Uh, so it's easy to forget about our UFOs. So I think the best solution for that is to pull them out and make them more present part of your life. And I do this by hanging them up. Uh, so if it's a quilt top, I will oftentimes, you know, just kind of uh, either tape that to the ceiling or I use very high powered magnets. These are neodymium magnets uh, that I just screw these to the wall about four inches down from the crown molding. And then you use a bar. Let me see if I've got one here handy. 
This is just a galvanized metal bar you can get at the hardware store, okay? And this sticks really, really firmly to that neodymium magnet, and it doesn't hurt your quilt. Uh, you can just, just simply by putting, um, sorry, <laughs> wrapping the quilt around the top of the bar, just even a, a quilt top, not quilted, a quilt top, you can wrap uh, that just very gently around the top bar and then clamp that to the magnet screwed to your wall. And then you have your quilt top so that you can display it and you can see it on your wall in your home. And I love this, especially in my dining room on an unfinished project, because then as I'm eating, you know, every meal and I have an open uh, kitchen so I can see into my dining room uh, as I'm cooking. So I can look at the quilt on the wall while I'm cooking and while I'm eating. And all that time spent looking at it is really important because a lot of times what gets us stuck is not knowing how to quilt it. You know, not knowing the quilting design that needs to go on that quilt in order to finish it. And that can get things really stuck and locked in place and, and you can't move forward and you don't know what you wanna do with it and you don't, know, um, you don't know how to finish it. And I find having it displayed like that really makes a big difference because then you can start looking at it and seeing beyond the piecing, seeing beyond the applique and going, oh, I really wanna emphasize that spot, or I really want to create a new unique motif for that area. And you can start looking at your quilt in a different way and looking for texture, which is our quilting stitches, to add to the piecing or applique or the quilt construction. So having it hang might not be something that you've ever thought of doing before. And I've, I've done this for years. I, I, I have either you know magnets or curtain rods or something hanging pretty much on any big wall in my house. <laughs> I stick them up everywhere I can. And it's really nice because you never know when, you know, just randomly walking across the room or, you know, making dinner, you'll look up at the quilt and be like, that's how I want to quilt it. You know, that's the next step. And also having the quilt hanging, even if it's a bed quilt, gives you a different perspective on the quilt. You can step back from it. You can see it. You can see different things in the quilt that you might not have seen when your face is right up on it as you're piecing, as you're constructing the quilt. So you, you, you're able to step back. You're able to get a different perspective. The quilt is in your home and you're actively seeing it so that you're living with it unfinished. And that creates a certain tension, which I think is really good. You know, like I said, it's really easy to forget about stuff when it's tucked away in a bin or a drawer. Then it, it doesn't hurt that we haven't finished it. It's not present in our minds. But when it's hanging on the wall and there's raggedy edges and stuff, you know, Josh is always like, he can tolerate you know, the raggedy edges, the weirdness of something for about a month. And then he's like, when are you going to finish that up? You know, he starts putting pressure on me to get it done too. And that also helps. You can have outside pressure kind of nudging you towards getting things finished. So that's all really, really good. I would say if something is partially quilted, it's a little harder to hang because it's heavier. Um, but those neodymium magnets are pretty serious stuff. And that can be really, really helpful. Uh, you can, again, just use the bar and I will link up those magnets. I got mine on Amazon. Uh, so you can grab those and then it's just a galvanized metal bar from the um, hardware department where you kind of, where you can find a lot of struts and stuff and fun things for uh, building uh, in any hardware store. And that works really, really well. And no matter whether the quilt is partially quilted or it's just a plain top, you can pop it up and then when you get the quilt done, you have a place to display it as well. So this is a method that I have used for many, many years and it absolutely helps to be able to, number one, feel that pain of something not being done. And then it also really helps to not forget about the project and it really helps to be able to start planning and thinking and uh, designing when you're not, you know, and, and then oftentimes, you know, when you have that pressure, you know, that I need to figure out the quilting design right this second, that's too much pressure. It's hard for me even to come up with something on the fly like that. I really like to look at the quilt and kind of peruse it and be thinking about it, mulling it over. I just let my brain munch and munch and munch on it. And then slowly 
ideas start to form. It's like, okay, I want diamonds over there. Or I want, you know, I want circles. You know, this is, uh, I have a quote hanging behind me here while I do the podcast. This is Dream Goddess. And this is exactly what I did with her. I had her on the wall, I think six months before I knew exactly how I wanted to quilt her. And, you know, there was, I had a temptation to just, you know, stick feathers everywhere and be done with it. But when I looked at it, I realized I really wanted circles to go in this one channel between her hair, which is filled with feathers, and the landscape, which is filled with just simple, you know, curving lines. And so I created these, these circles, these really big circles with different uh, templates. And it was the absolute perfect design for that space. So that probably I would not have had that inspiration if I had not hung the quilt on my wall and let it stay there and enjoyed it while I ate, while I cooked, while I, you know, everything I do sitting at the kitchen table, I probably wouldn't have had that idea. And then the quilt wouldn't have turned out as good. So I think that this is really a great way to become a better quilter too. Okay. So Number five, this one's going to be hard, guys. <laughs> You've got to get serious about finishing these projects. You have got to commit to finishing them. And that means no new fabric and no new projects. And there's a reason why I think this is really important, especially, I mean, if you're in the over 10 UFO projects, the unfinished projects area, and I am definitely over 10, <laughs> then um, I think you're at a point there you become a starting energy junkie. And what is that? So there's different uh, types of energy that we experience at different stages of a project. So when you are slicing and dicing into a new pack of fabric, let's say a pre-cut, then there's this excitement. Oh, I've got, you know, specialty fabric and it's really pretty and oh, you know, it's all stacked up and so nice and it's, you know, shiny and new and uh, it's exciting. It gives you that stimulation of something new. It's got 100% possibility. There's nothing wrong with it yet. You know, there's no been, been no mistakes made and um, it's maybe new colors that you haven't played with yet. So that's exciting too. So we get this boost with starting energy and it's, um, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it definitely can wake you up. And unfortunately, it's also very, very addictive because as soon as you hit, and, and, and this is the other thing about starting energy is it doesn't last. It's very transient <laughs> because as soon as we get into the messy middle of a project, and trust me, every single project I have ever made, and no matter how quick and no matter how simple, no matter how complicated, no matter how big, every single project has a messy middle. Every single project has a point where you're like, I just want it to be done. Can it just be done? I'm, ti I'm done. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. We all reach that point with every single project that we make. Uh, and that messy middle kills starting energy. So if you become a starting energy junkie, then you love that drive and that, you know, awesome feeling of slicing into new fabric. But the second that things start to get hard, that nice energy goes away. And then it's like, well, you know, I don't want to work on that anymore. I don't, I don't really want to do that anymore. I don't want to mess with that anymore. I really want that fix of starting energy. So then you go and grab another pre-cut. And then you go grab more fabric and then you go and start something new. So I would say if you have a lot of projects where like even the blocks aren't finished piecing, when the, the blocks aren't put together into the top, uh, you've got, you know, unfinished sashing, unfinished borders, unfinished applique, that would be definitely, in my opinion, be a sign that you're a starting energy junkie and you're liking the start. You're not liking the messy middle. And the messy middle is hard. It's hard to sustain, but it's necessary. You know, we are quilters because we make finished quilts, because we make quilts that are bound and three layers going through the stitches so that way that quilt can be washed a million times and hung on the wall or draped over a bed. It can be drug around the house. Your kids can build forts with them and that's how they last the test of time because they are three layers and they have quilting running through all three layers and the edges are bound and finished securely. So that is a finished quilt that makes us quilters. And I know this is hard. I know the messy middle is tough. 
Um, but there is another kind of energy that you get at the end, and that is finishing energy. It comes after you've gotten through the messy middle, you figured out what you needed to figure out. And I do really feel like every single project that we make makes us a better quilter and helps us reach the next step in our journey. And even the simplest project, we learn something with every single one. And um, just a quick aside, if you're starting to feel bored with quilting, if you are ever just meh, you know, like, Ugh, I'm just bored with this, that's a sign you're not pushing yourself hard enough to try new things and advance your skills. And maybe you've kind of gotten stuck in a little bit of a rut of doing the same thing over and over again, maybe too much pre-cut piecing, uh, you know, where you're not pushing yourself and pushing your edge to try new things. And that messy middle, when you try or trying something brand new and trying new skills, trying new techniques, that messy middle is even messier. It's even harder because then you're, you're really pushing yourself. But that's where the magic happens, guys. That's where the good stuff happens. That's where a project becomes the most meaningful and cherished because it's hard. We don't do this because it's easy. We don't do this because it's fast. We do this because it's a challenge to us, right? You kind of have to wrap your brain around that. You know, we make quilts. We slice up perfectly good fabric <laughs> and then piece it all back together again because it's hard, because it shows our skill as quilters when all those seams match, because it shows our skill as quilters when the fabric colors come together just exactly right. So understand what's going into this and that the messy middle is not only necessary, but that's where our skill is being built. Now, finishing energy. Finishing energy is a slower, steadier form of energy it comes, I find it usually starts to kick in when I can see the light at the end of the tunnel of a project. I can see that I'm getting close to finishing it. Uh, I feel finishing energy when it's a, it's a big project and it's like, wow, I actually got this done. I didn't think it was going to, I was going to get done for like six more months. And it's this, um, it's less exciting. It's less heart pumping, you know, like on the edge of my seat, so excited because it, it, you know, it still requires that methodical step-by-step -step process to see the quilt all the way to, through to the end, to binding, to getting every, um, all the ducks in a row, to getting everything finished. But it is absolutely a sustaining energy and then it can carry you into finishing another project. And it builds. The more finishes that you get, the more it's sustaining you to work through that messy middle. Because I find as I finish something, I have then the strength and the patience and the motivation to work through the challenges and the struggles of the messy middle with more projects. But we miss all of this. We miss the messy middle. We miss the chance to learn. We miss the skill builders and we miss that finishing energy when all we do is start new projects. So yes, you have got to stop starting more stuff. <laughs> stop starting. That works. Uh, stop buying. Uh, that, I mean, unless it's necessary to buy batting and backing fabric for your next project, you know, to get a quilt top basted and ready for quilting, stop buying to piece, stop buying to, you know, kits to make another quilt, stop buying to add more projects to your list and start focusing on just finishing the most meaningful quilts in your stack. Okay, so once you get serious and you decide that you're not gonna buy anymore, that's a hard decision to make, but it is a very important to, it's very important to make that critical decision because otherwise it's easy to continue down that same path, you know, and we have to at some point just say, no, this is the line in the sand. I really want to finish these projects before I buy and invest in anything else. So now it's time to start thinking about what exactly made that project stop and get stuck. And stuck is a really important word here. And I want you to start thinking about what is stuck? What is locking this in place? So there's a reason why every quilt is unfinished. You know, whether it is, I don't know how to quilt it. 
Um, I don't know which batting to use, or I, I need to buy more backing fabric, or I need to go piece the backing, you know, whatever you have decided to do. I would say, just a personal aside, it is so much easier to get everything done if you just get 108 inch wide backing fabric. This is just my own personal tip. Uh, I hate piecing my backs uh, unless I get dad to do it for me. I hate piecing backings because I find it time consuming and it's it's more of an extra step that I don't really wanna do. So I don't do that. I always go with super, super wide fabric. Lately I've been using a lot of Minky, which is available in 90 inch widths. So 90 inch wide Minky, or you can get batiks up to, I think 108 inches wide. Uh, so you can get fabric where you can cover even a huge quilt in one pass. And that is always my favorite way of doing it. And I just really dislike having to buy tons and tons and tons of yardage, wash it all, press it all, cut the selvages off, piece it all together. It, to me, that is, that, is, that is the part that really gets me stuck in place. And that's why I just go on ahead and buy really big backing fabrics. So that's just a personal side as far as you know, getting that part unstuck. That's my solution. It's a little bit more expensive, but time-wise, if you're calculating your time of messing with, you know, 45 inch wide fabric and washing it all in one big long chunk, which is a pain, and then pressing it all in one big ch chunk, which is also a pain, and then piecing it all together in one big chunk. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a continual hassle. So in my opinion, the extra little bit of cost of really, really wide fabric is absolutely worth the time that you save having to piece it. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, so what exactly are your most meaningful projects stuck on? This is a really important question. This is number six, okay? So number six <laughs> is uh, figuring out why it was stuck in the first place. Dream Goddess, this quote behind me, was stuck for three years. It was stuck for three solid years. Folded up in a closet, no progress being made. She was absolutely an unfinished project. I'd pull her out and maybe quilt a little bit and then stick it right back in the closet. I just didn't have time to work on it. But what happened was in the sky section, I had established a feather design over here. And then I thought, oh, it would be really cool if I used like different free motion quilting fillers in the other half of the sky section. And so it's these rays that I, I decided to pick different quilting designs for. Well, that left a question mark, a question mark in my quilt so that I was able to quilt everything perfectly fine, no problem, up to that point. And then I had this question mark on the quilt. What do I, what, what designs do I use? What designs do you use? I, I had trouble picking because by that point I was tired, I was depleted. I could not make up my mind. I could not make the decision. And my lack of ability to make up my mind and make that decision made this quilt get stuck for three years. This can happen, this happens to me, you know, and this happens to me a lot because I can get, it can become too precious. Like, oh my gosh, if I pick the wrong thing, it's gonna be ruined. Yes, I, I experience and deal with that and worry, that worry comes up for me a lot. You know, I've got this little tree landscape that I painted and I've been feeling that a little bit of, you know, oh my gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to quilt it. I might mess it up. You know, I might go in there and pick the wrong thing. And the solution, number one, is to pull on your big girl panties and do it anyway. <laughs> you know, jerk them up and let's go. Uh, don't give yourself the opportunity to get yourself stuck. Keep moving forward. When I actually finally pushed myself and just said, just Stick whatever you want in those rays, Leah. Just get it done. When I actually pushed myself and made myself finish it, I had one startling revelation, and that was it did not matter. You know, I'm going to move the camera so you guys can see. Those rays, it absolutely doesn't matter. I could have stuck anything in those areas. I could have quilted any design, and it would have looked just as fine. You know, it was not the choice of design that was so crucial. It was just deciding to quilt it and be done with it, right? Uh, and it did not need that level of precious agony in order to get it done. So we can be our own worst enemies when it comes to making things too complicated. And so I'd say, number one, simplify. Uh, 
stop making it so precious. It is just fabric and batting and thread. That is it. It is not embossed in gold. We're not working, most people are not working with gold thread, although you may be, but even still, it is not gold. It is not, uh, a, you know, we're not, we're not cutting diamonds here, guys, <laughs> where it's just ruined if we make a mistake. Uh, you know, it is okay if it's not exactly the way that you envisioned it in your head, that can happen for your next quilt. You know, whenever it didn't come out quite right, that tension can carry to your next quilt. And then you can say, oh, well, what did I learn? Well, I learned that I wanted more of this and less of this, and then now I'm gonna try it that way. So even if you end a project with a little bit of regret, that can be a lesson to carry to the next project. It's not something that you have to agonize about in the project that you're working on right now. A lot of my projects get stuck because in my head, I, I've inflated how much time it's gonna take to get them done. So, oh my gosh, it's gonna take forever and I'll never get it done. I'll be bogged down with that for months and months and months and months and months and I make it a big, huge deal. And that's not true. It, it's usually not true, I should say. Uh, it's usually I'm inflating it, number one, and then number two, it's not nearly going to be that bad if I work on it steadily over time. And we're gonna get into that. Uh, but nothing lasts forever. I can definitely say that. <laughs> Having finished several UFOs in the last couple of months, I can say nothing lasts forever, even if you have decided to piece a quilt with quarter inch hexagons, nothing lasts forever. You will get it done eventually. Uh, so don't get stuck on it being so time consuming. You know, understand that you went into that project. You decided to piece it that way. You chose that pack of quarter inch hexes. So you've got to own your past decisions. And if that is the project that is the most meaningful, then you have to you know, you bit off that slice of cake, so now you gotta eat it, you know? You gotta do the work and get it done. Uh, but understanding why a project is stuck is, I think, the key in so many ways. Um, is it stuck on the quilting design? Is it stuck on not having the right materials? Did, uh, did you mess up cutting your fabric and now do you not have enough fabric to cut? Uh, did you not buy enough to start with? Can you not find that fabric now in stores? That is a serious thing that a lot of quilters struggle with. And I would say the, the first step is to be open to changing the project to fit what you have. Rather than buying more or struggling to find it, which it's a lot easier now, I find, to find certain fabrics. You know, because of the internet, you can search that name of the fabric. If you happen to have a little bit of the selvage left, then maybe you can search for it. You might be able to find it obscurely, you know, somewhere on Etsy or eBay. You never know where you'll be able to find some yardage. But another idea would be to push yourself, if you absolutely can't find more of that fabric, another idea would be to push yourself towards changing the project and saying, okay, this isn't gonna be a king size quilt. Maybe it can be a full size quilt. Maybe it can be a tablecloth quilt now. Maybe it can be a, um, a throw quilt from my son or a throw quilt from my daughter or a gift quilt or a charity quilt. You know, be open. I think a lot of times we get stuck because we're very rigid. It's like the project goes into a box of this is what it is and it is not gonna be anything different. It is only this, it can only be this and it can't be anything else because I need this, this and this in order to finish it. Well. The second that you take those restrictions off, you know, the quilt can be a different size. I don't need to make all those blocks. I don't need to add that sashing. I don't have to add that border. I can change it. I have the power and the intelligence and the capability to change it. When you give yourself that permission, you open the door, you open the box, you, you blow the project out of the box. So it's no longer stuck but you have to be willing and ready to then calculate the math yourself and, and calculate what, how it's gonna change and how you're going to finish it. I'd say one of the number one questions that I receive via email, and, and I can't answer these questions, guys. Uh, it's usually along the lines of, I have a quilt or I wanna make one of your quilts, but I don't like the way you made it or I don't like the pattern and the size it is. 
can you help me change the size? And the answer is no. I, I simply cannot take a pattern and upscale it or resize it or change the blocks or you know double the blocks or any of that kind of stuff because it takes too much time. It is, it is a niche problem. It is uh, something that is unique to that quilter and the problems that she's having with that particular pattern. That is something that an individual quilter must do and must take on herself. And it's not impossible, but it, it is another skill. It is a design skill. And that might not be something that you've ever developed before. And I'll share with you my very complex tools of the trade. Uh, designing any quilt, it begins with really three things. Dig in here in my drawer here real quick. I'll share my very complex tools for fabric design. It starts with a pencil, a ruler, and I don't have any graph paper out here, but basically graph paper, a ruler, and a pencil. Those are my tools for designing a quilt. Even now I have computer programs, of course, I usually will start uh, with a design on paper and then I might move it to a computer program to play with it a little bit, but basically, Everything I design starts on paper, and it's as simple as drawing something, planning it, calculating it, um, tweaking it, and that's where your eraser is for. You know, it's not that complicated. And I think a lot of times we get bogged down and kind of stuck with this idea that we can't change something from the way that it was designed originally, uh, and, or that we can't calculate the fabrics ourselves. Fabric calculation is more complicated. And I would say when you're buying a pattern, that's actually what you're buying. You're buying someone else's fabric calculation in order to know what to buy in order to make that quilt. Uh, if you're not comfortable with that, not comfortable with you know trying to get the math just exactly right, I'd say buy two yards of, of the fabric that you need to finish the project. And you're most likely going to have a little bit of extra left over unless you're doing super, super wide borders, in which case you might need three or four yards of fabric. But that's my general rule. If I'm looking at something and going, okay, well, I wanna change it up or I wanna add sashing or I wanna add double the blocks or something like that, I just usually go to the store and buy two yards of fabric. Uh, and that's just, that's served me really well for the last 10 years. And, and that works, you know, generally on all projects. I usually end up with a good bit of fabric left over and that's okay too. Uh, so that's kind of my ballpark. Um, but even more than just redesigning something, uh, you can also just decide that instead of piecing, you know, 50 blocks, you've pieced five. Well, that can become a table runner. Instead of feeling this pressure to make a king size quilt that you don't particularly like, make it into a tablecloth quilt. You know, go on ahead and blow it out of that box and get it out from being stuck. If the project is very meaningful to you and you really like it, but you no longer need that king size quilt or you no longer need that throw quilt, make it something that you actually do need, that you will enjoy in your home. Uh, I don't see enough wall hangings in quilters' homes. I really think that this is something that uh, is really nice to see. And it doesn't have to be quilted super densely. You can stitch a quilt in the ditch and then still hang it on the wall. That's perfectly, perfectly fine. Um, I just think that patchwork or applique looks amazing when it's displayed. So if a quilt has gotten stuck because, you know, whether it's you've changed beds or, you know, you don't want to piece that many blocks, which I can't blame you, you know, we kind of all can get bite off more than we can chew thinking that we have more time for something and then we end up not. So take what you've made and turn it into something usable. And if you have to buy fabric, you know, get two yards, start with that and see if that will take you. And then another thing that can be really helpful is work with solids. So let's say you have blocks. This is just a, a general example that I think is a really good one. Let's say you have a whole mess of blocks and you want sashing for them. Don't go pick a print, pick a solid. And then, you know, usually Kona cotton solids in most big box stores are kind of a standard 100% cotton that you can find. You can always find them in stock. Uh, and that way, if you run out of fabric, you can always go back and get more. And, you know, not all whites are white, uh, but, you know, if you get like a specific, let's say, canary yellow, then you know you can go back and look for canary yellow and you can find that color again. 
So I'd say, you know, if you're looking at, okay, well, I don't know how, exactly how much fabric I'm going to need, pick a fabric that you can easily swap out, you know, or different, you could also do different colors. You could mix it up by saying, okay, well, I'm going to get a half yard of these three different blues. And then if I need to get more fabric, I can just get more half yards of different colors of blue. And that makes the quilt more interesting, which is always good. And it stops you from getting stuck because you can't find that specific fabric again. You know, at any point in time, you can decide to change it up and don't worry quite so much. Don't get locked in place about everything being matchy matchy, just exactly right. Be open to being creative and changing it in a way that's going to work and work with what you have. Okay. So that is really, I guess it's stuck is really hard. I mean, this is the thing. And then this is different for every individual project. I've got 50 UFOs at least, probably more. Every single one of them is stuck for a different reason, whether it is, you know, oh, I, I, I want to quilt it, but it, you know, maybe it's not super meaningful. Um, maybe I want to design a ruler for it. You know, that's getting into a whole different other complexity. Uh, you know, some of my quilts, it's like, well, I'm reserving that before I, you know, for working on a book. Uh, some of my quilts are set aside because it's like, oh, I really don't have time for that right this second. Lately, I have been prioritizing all of my goddess quilts. I have several unfinished goddess quilts, so they are 100% the priority, which is awesome. Uh, so everything else is kind of going, no, you're not as meaningful as finishing this goddess that's been in progress for years. So prioritizing, number one, and priority is singular. You can only work on one at a time. I could say with quilters, depending on your setup, you might be able to work on three projects at a time. I usually have one quilt on my long arm or my sewing machine for quilting. Uh, and I have one quilt that's being pieced. And then I have one quilt that's in handwork that where I'm, I'm, I'm constructing or I'm working on it primarily by hand, uh, hand stitches. So depending on your setup, you could have multiple projects going at once, but you know, physically you can only work on one thing at a time. Uh, but just keep that in mind, you know, as far as where things go in your home, have, have a different project at each of your stations. And then it's no question in the evening, whenever you you know had dinner, relaxing, then you can just sit down and get to work, whether it's on your home sewing machine, on your long arm, sitting down and hand stitching, you've got something that you can work on. And that really, really helps. And that comes into number seven, and that is decide to move, decide to get it unstuck. You've recognized why something is stu uh, stuck, why it got put in a box, why it's not moving, and decide that it's no longer stuck. Decide what you're going to do next. Make those design changes. Decide what you want to do with it. You're going to get it moving. So that's number seven. Number eight. This is really important, and I kind of already alluded to it a little bit, and that is calculate the time you have left. This is something I don't think many quilters do, and I think it's really important. If you are piecing a block, time yourself. Set a little timer, and you know, I use my phone. You can just set a timer and just let it run uh, in a stopwatch, and then you can know how much time, okay, well, that block is gonna take 30 minutes to piece. You know, and now you know, okay, well, 30 minutes. So that means if I've got 50 blocks, maybe if I can piece one block a night, then I will have all the blocks done in one month. That might sound like a lot of time, but that's 30 minutes every single day. And in one month, all the blocks will be done. That to me makes it very manageable so that you know, okay, going into September and I have this big quilt. By October, I'll have it done you know, I have the blocks done and then I can get the sashing on maybe through October and then it'll be ready to quilt in November. That's how my mind works. I like a schedule. I like having a ballpark, like, okay, the quilt's gonna be in this stage at this month and then I can be looking forward to this. That's how I work. And then when I fall behind, I, can I, you know, I have to renegotiate that a little bit when I fall behind. But usually, especially if I am Moving forward and moving at a faster pace than I thought, I love finishing ahead. Feeling like I'm ahead of the game makes me feel an extra boost. It's almost as good as starting energy. In fact, actually, I would say for me, it's better to feel that, ha, oh, I made extra progress. And this is something like happiness wise. I read a lot about what makes us happy and 
making steady progress on anything makes us happier in general versus, you know, like versus no progress at all, which is not any fun. Uh, or, you know, like that kind of slam through it, get it done in a rush, you know, kind of progress. That's exhausting. But a little bit of progress every single day really makes us happier people. It makes us feel effective. And I, I always feel like, you know, when a project gets stuck, it stops making me happy completely. I, I stop feeling any joy in working on it because it's like every time I touch it, it's like, oh, it's still stuck. I still don't know. You know, every time I pulled this quilt out, dream got us out and got a little bit more quilting done on the raise, it was still had that stuck feeling of I don't know what else I'm doing. Like I pick one design, but I didn't pick the other eight. You know, so it stayed in that bogged down stuck state until I finally just picked all the designs and decided it's gonna get done, it's gonna get finished. Uh, so calculating the time left is, a, you know, you do have to time yourself. You do have to kind of roughly time yourself, use a stopwatch. Um, I did this with Express Your Love. Here's a picture of this quilt. Uh, this particular Express Your Love had quarter inch hexes in her face, half inch hexes through her body, and three eighth inch hexes through her arm. It was over 400 hexes that I still needed to piece. And I went into this, I started working on it again in May, and it was kind of like, a, maybe I could get this done in order to have a photograph for my goddess book, which I'm working on right now. And I started working on it thinking maybe, maybe I might be able to get, you no, know, might be able to get her body done. I don't know. Well, 15 minutes a night, or 30 minutes a night is how much I set aside. 30 minutes a night, I was quickly able to to calculate, wow, okay, I can I can prepare, and this was English paper piecing, so it's kind of a two-step process. You have to fold the fabrics over the pieces of paper and baste them in place, and then you have to stitch them together. So I decided to prepare all of them first so that all the pieces I needed would be prepped, and then I do the stitching together. And I like this because I could sit down and say, here is 15 pieces that I need to prepare. I would get those 15 pieces done, and then every day I would write down, I had I think for her arm, I had 186 pieces that I had to put, I had to prepare. And every day I would write down the number that I had prepped slash 186. So it was like at the beginning, it was like 15 slash 186. So I had 15 done out of 186. And then, I, you know, as I went, that became really addictive to see that number go up. It's like, oh, I've got 100, 100 out of 186. I only have 86 more to go. You know, and every night I would write in my journal how many I had accomplished you know so then it became you know in that 30 minutes i got 15 done well then sometimes it'd be like oh well you know i can watch another silly show on amazon and you know knock out another 15. so then i started kind of doubling my number and it wasn't a hardship it was just it was exciting to see that progress being made and so in a matter of a week i got all of the three eighth inch hexes for her arm knocked out and prepped up and then setting down and piecing those together, I didn't have an estimate for how much time that would take. So I started by just piecing the hexagons into rows and seeing how many rows I could create. So I realized, okay, I can make three rows per night. And once I started, you know, kind of on that track, I did this exact same thing. Okay, well, I can get three rows done and then I stop. You know, when I have a not, when I'm really, really feeling busy or stressed out, then it's like, okay, three rows and stop, I'm done. But the nights that I felt more relaxed and I have more time and I was like, oh, I'll stay up a little bit later, you know, that kind of thing. Then I was like, oh, I could get 10 rows knocked out. And then putting those together, it all chained. It chained together and it ended up taking far less time than I ever would have thought when the project was in a bin, you know, when it was in my head, not in reality. We tend to inflate things in our head and make it bigger and more time consuming than it actually is going to be. You know, so in my head it was, oh, this is gonna be just so time consuming and so hard and it's gonna take forever and I'll be doing this forever and it'll be October before I get all these hexies pieces. No, I had all of that knocked out, you know, barely halfway through July. So it can take less time than you anticipate once you actually time yourself and start working within that time budget. And I would say, 15 minutes a day is a huge accomplishment. Just putting, saying, okay, 15, and that's actually number nine, 15 minutes a day. Uh, so you're, you have your UFOs, the most meaningful ones, you've decided to get them out of being stuck, you've identified what the next step is, now 
15 minutes a day. And like I said, have it set up so all you have to do is sit down at your sewing machine and start quilting. You don't have to do any prep, you don't have to wind bobbins, you know, make sure to get all of that fiddly stuff done on one particular day where you're just like, okay, I, the, today is prep day, I'm gonna clean out my machine, I'm gonna oil it, I'm gonna get all my bobbins wound for this project, it's all gonna be ready to go, so all I have to do is just sit down and do my stitching. And then it's effortless because you don't have to question what you're doing next. You don't have to, you know, I gotta go clean out those dust bunnies for my machine. I gotta go oil it. I gotta go do all this other stuff. You don't, you're not getting blocked by things in your path. You have smooth sailing, set down, get your piecing in, get off the machine. And then those 15 minutes, it's very easily to turn those 15 minutes into 30 and those 30 minutes into 45. It just naturally happens. You know, you're kind of in the groove, you're relaxed, you're enjoying yourself, and then you end up spending a little bit more time than you anticipated, and that's good, because that just gets the progress, a little bit more progress done on that project, which means it's gonna get knocked out that much faster. And it also means that you're seeing that change, you're seeing it uh, get closer to that finish, and then you start tapping into that finishing energy. And all of that is good. All of that is really the key to finishing our unfinished projects. Okay, so the last one, number 10. Number 10 is slow and steady, 15 minutes a day. That's perfectly fine. But sometimes on some projects, you really got to just put yourself in jail. So I'm going to just open this up as an alternative. Like, so you can do number nine and just 15 minutes a day, and that's perfectly fine. But sometimes, maybe on a Saturday, maybe on a Sunday, you know, when you have a little bit of extra time, put yourself in jail and say, I am only working on this. This is all I'm working on. I am not allowed to leave my sewing machine until this part is done. I am not allowed to be distracted. I am not allowed to go get a drink of water. I am not allowed to have a snack. You know, it's put yourself, I mean, within reason, guys, okay. But put yourself in jail until that part of the project is done. And then give yourself a reward. Then it's chocolate or ice cream or, you know, a, a nice bath in a book, you know, something like that. I oftentimes, sometimes for me, jail is I'm not allowed <laughs> to buy a book because I'll usually end up reading in the evening rather than sewing in the evening. So it's like right now I am not allowed to buy another book and start another book until I get all of my stitching done on the borders and stuff that I have for that express your love. So I've got to get that done before I touch another book, which is really hard because I, you know, I've, I just started a new book. I really, really want to read it, but I'm in jail. I can't do that. I've got to get this other thing done first. So this was something from my friend Luann Fisher, and she was on the podcast a couple months ago, and we talked about quitting video games because it was such a waste of time. And she said, there's, there's three things that you can do. You can spend your time you can invest your time and you can waste your time. And I absolutely love that. Now I consider reading a book, you know, it's spending my time wisely. I love reading, um, but finishing, getting to the next step of a quilt, a particularly a very meaningful quilt, in my opinion, is an investment. That's an investment of my time in creating something that I love and I can use and enjoy for the rest of my life. Uh, so in my opinion, working on the quilt is an investment, not an expense. But doing things like watching TV, playing video games, browsing the internet, watching YouTube, all of those things, unless I'm also stitching at the same time, all of those things are just a waste of my time. That's my own judgment. That's how I compartmentalize stuff. But that's also how I very carefully use the time that I have. And I do get a lot done. Uh, you know, and, and I, and I get this question a lot and I actually did a whole podcast on it and that was, do you ever sleep? You know, this is what a lot of professional quilters hear when we go and do lectures and workshops and that kind of thing. And it's just a difference on how we use our time. I know, you know, like Jenny Beyer, for example, she still hand pieces and hand quilts, I believe, all of her quilts. In order to do that, she's got to be doing a lot of stitching pretty much all the time. Uh, but she's able to do that because obviously she spends or invests her time wisely. And I, I think this is just a, a way of thinking about it and making that realizing, it's more than, more than anything else, realizing that when you choose, when I choose, I should say, when I choose to pick up that book, I am also choosing not to work on my quilt. When I choose 
to watch TV and not be stitching something, I am choosing not to work on my quilt. One choice is also a second choice of what I'm not doing, you know? And so everything, everything is more, everything we choose to do is also choosing not to do something else. And that, when I really started to realize that and, and pull that into my habits and my, you know, my day-to-day -day schedule, things really started to change for me because then I realized what, what is the most important, most essential thing for me to be working on? Well, the thing that is most meaningful. I wanna get those projects done that it's like, oh, it drives me nuts that I haven't gotten that done yet. You know, and that was a big reason of how I got Dream Goddess done in 2018 is that that project had been on my table, you know, or folded up in a closet since 2015. It was awful that it took that long to finish you know, really six hours left of quilting. It really wasn't that much time. I just had to make that choice to stop prioritizing other things and choosing to do, you know, the easier stuff. It's wasting my time basically on video games, on, you know, watching silly stuff and to decide to spend my time most wisely on that investment that was making a fantastic quilt. So I hope that this makes sense. Uh, I hope that this has helped you break down your UFOs and look at them in a different way and understand that, you know, the key here is to take a UFO, an unfinished project, an unfinished object, and turn it into a work in progress, a WIP, uh, where you are actively working on it 15 minutes a day. You're actively doing a get, you know, put it in jail day and, and putting, you know, several hours into it maybe at once. And that can give you a great leap forward. Um, you're actively deciding to take those extra steps to, you know, to wind all your bobbins, to get your machine clean so that way you can sit down and it's going to be smooth sailing. It's going to be super, super easy to do. And this takes, it, it's harder than just grabbing a pre-cut and slicing it up and making something new. It is harder, but this is the work that we must do if we want to have finished quilts that can be used and enjoyed. And this is just a, a, a last aside, and that is the danger of leaving quilts unfinished. Because unless you have a family of quilters at your back, which is awesome if you do, but unless your, let's say, daughter-in-law, your daughter, your nieces, nephews, your cousins, someone in your family also makes quilts, your quilt tops are very likely to end up in the trash if they are not finished quilts. Ultimately, of course, we don't have any control over what happens to our stuff after we pass away, right? But finished quilts are something that people can use. It's something people can understand. I grew up with dozens of patchwork quilts when I was a little girl and I slept under them. And that's a large reason why I'm a quilter today because I loved having those quilts from my grandmothers and great grandmothers and there was just there was one magical day where I woke up and it was a chilly fall morning and my dad had put a heavy quilt on me over the night. You know, I think I had just had a sheet on and then he threw a quilt on me and I woke up just feeling that, that weight and that heat and that hug and it felt like I was being hugged by my great grandmother who made that quilt. And that memory still, it has the power, you know, to turn me into a quilter basically. That. Uh, that was such a magical memory that I, you know, I've chased after it ever since. I love that. That's why I love quilts. That's why I love sleeping under quilts on my bed because there's just, there's nothing else like that. And a store-bought quilt doesn't feel the same way. Uh, and a well-worn quilt, I should say, also does not feel like a new quilt either. Um, finished quilts, well-used, well-loved quilts have a particular feel, have a particular meaning to them that you know, a quilt top is just never going to have. And a quilt top cannot be used. If it gets dirty and someone tries to throw it in the washing machine, could you just imagine what would happen to that? It would fall apart. It would become a big frayed mess. And I actually, my mom had a quilt top for years and she would spread it out over the bed, kind of like a, a, a bed spread. And then she'd take it off. You know, she didn't want to wear it out too much, but I ended up with that uh, several years ago when I ended up quilting it. So to turn it into a finished quilt, because it was falling apart, you know, and I had to do a lot of repair for those seams because even just spreading the quilt out over the bed and not even really sleeping under it had damaged it in many ways. 
So this is something to think about. Do we want to leave our families with finished quilts that can be used and enjoyed and cherished and loved and pass this amazing craft down to our kids and our grandkids? I mean, I didn't know my great grandmothers, but they absolutely influenced me, you know, far, far after their death, right? Or if we, the alternative is to leave quilt tops, which are weight, they are a question mark that, you know, a burden really in a lot of ways that, you know, family members really don't know what to do with them. They feel a certain level of guilt to throw them away. And, and, and it can really, you know, this is, this is one of those things that someone particularly, you know, emotional person gets left with something like that, then they could, that could be something that they hoard you know, that they stash away and they can't get rid of it and they can't do anything with it and it stays stuck for them. And that's really, I think, a burden that we shouldn't be leaving on our family. Uh, and this is, well, I have, there's a little bit of hoarding in my family. <laughs> I can absolutely say that. And I, so I've seen the negative side of this. I can see how extreme that can go. And I'd say, let's absolutely not do that to our family. Let's leave them beautiful finished quilts that can be used and enjoyed and loved and cherished. And that will create more quilters in our families. I promise you it absolutely will. So I hope that this has helped you. I hope that this has helped you get your projects unstuck. I've helped you, I hope this has helped you sort them by what is the most meaningful. So that way you can be working on the things that challenge you, that are gonna push you. And yes, it's gonna get messy in the middle. And yes, you might shed some tears, but every single project that you make, you are going to become a better, stronger, smarter, more skilled and talented quilter. And that's where it's at, guys. That's the whole point. We do this because it's hard, not because it's quick and easy. We do this to make amazing quilts. So let's go finish some. So I hope that you have an amazing quilting week. Don't forget to sign up for the notification to get the pre-order email for my goddess quilt book. The pre-order I'm hoping is going to start November 1st. So come and check that out at leahday.com slash goddess. Until next time, let's go quilts.